I'm currently spending six weeks solo backpacking through Vietnam. You can't help but immediately fall in love with this place. Cheers. 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 Starting in Saigon, I'm traveling via bus, train, boat, plane, and bike, finishing up at Ha Giang in the very north. Be interesting to see what it's actually like, to see if it's worth the day out or whether it's just a picture. So let's go find out. You're confused. <laughs> but now it sounds like we're going to a rave. <laughs> you go around the corner and it opens up. It's like, whoa. This is so impressive. So we're at the start of the High Van Pass. If we're going to get these views for the next hour, it's going to be sick. It's like something from a different world, like a different planet. It's unreal. <laughs> My trip began two weeks ago, spending a few nights checking out the various tourist highlights around Ho Chi Minh City. Then I made my way up to the beautiful town of Dalat Holy shit. before hiring out a bike and riding through to Central Highlands with Danny, who I made friends with at the hostel. So as soon as Danny speaks Vietnamese, they're like, wow, they love it. Does that look Mexican? <laughs> Arriving in Nha Trang, I didn't think much of the town, so I head up to Ki Non, but I was unfortunately a bit under the weather, so I rested up so that I could properly enjoy the next leg of my trip. I got up at 5 in the morning to get the bus from Ki Non up to Hoi An. So it's 8.45 in the morning, just going to stop on the bus journey. And there's a wedding going on, and they're blasting music out like it's a rave. It's a five-hour journey up to Hoi An, and I'll be meeting up with Danny, plus Emmanuel, who I met in Saigon, and although our schedules hadn't aligned during the day, we'd been meeting up for beers at most of the stops on my trip so far. Well, All right, I've made it to Hoi An. Feeling better now, refreshed. Cold's nearly gone, so I'm doing good. Emmanuel's been in the wars, falling off his bike. Danny's just getting stalked as always. But yeah, we're gonna have a little explore around the town. It's supposed to be a really, really beautiful town. We're looking forward to this. Hello. <laughs> it's like I'm back in Morocco, where they just jump on you with stuff. The most touristy photo ever. Wow. It's beautiful here. Hoi An used to be a major port city before the trade moved up to the nearby town of Da Nang at the start of the 19th century. The old town preserves its incredible melting pot history with the colorful French colonial buildings, Chinese temples, and the iconic Japanese covered bridge. <laughs> Hoi An's center became a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1999, with its primary business now being tourism. Okay, this is officially the most pretty town in Vietnam. It is winds, absolutely winds. Oh, it is busy and touristy, but you can't help but immediately fall in love with this place. It's just like it's got such a nice charm to it. It's so beautiful, and I can't wait to see it at night as well when all these lanterns are lit up. Let's try this. Well, yeah, we're just spending the afternoon actually just exploring the town. Stopped at this little cafe to relax. What have you ordered? Egg coffee. Egg coffee. Egg coffee. Yes. Stir. It is weird. <laughs> okay, now it is. Ah, okay. That's better now. Yep, that's better. I don't drink coffee, but I do like egg, so 50 50 chance I like this. Oh. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's a coffee. It's a coffee I don't like. These colorful buildings in the balconies. Randomly reminds me of New Orleans. Yeah. Hello, Rudy's. It's five o'clock somewhere. 
<laughs> so last year I traveled around quite a few countries that are predominantly Muslim. So it's sort of nice to be able to just walk around with a beer. Cheers guys. Cheers. 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 at the fish market so you can like watch what you're standing in but they had this huge party on apparently for Chinese New Year and all the men and women were all drinking together it wasn't segregated but yeah fun little random thing to find which one are you going for? what size? Danny bought the faux metal jacket singlet and I was like I want one too. <laughs> and then, so I was going to get that, but then I also saw Yoda. Yoda. Yay! Gonna have to get that too. Yeah, Yoda. Yoda. You may Yoda. want to get one size up though, it will probably shrink a little bit. How much for two? Uh, 40,000. 40. Uh, okay, yeah, deal. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. Okay, So, yeah, if you want some badass t shirts in Hoi An, come to this shop. Very nice shop. <laughs> yeah. Very nice. Cheers. Cheers. Our new t shirts. <laughs> Damn. It's been a fun afternoon exploring Hoi An. Bought two singlets, two t shirts, and two beers so far. But, yeah, I love this town. These giant model boats just make me think of the Vietnam Top Gear Special. I'm not riding with one of them on my bike though. We're only, we're like a two minute walk from the Japanese bridge, but just sort of back away from the main street. And then, you know, there's still t-shirt shops over there, but this is like a little local joint on the corner that we just walk past. And uh, again, once again, the blessing of having Danny with you is he can just translate and order stuff for you. Um, Emmanuel just sits there, he's doing everything. Now you're a good guy, Emmanuel, don't you worry. Don't you worry. Cheers, bro. Cheers. Yeah, watermelon shirt later. Yeah, we're going to buy you a watermelon shirt later. Oh, dear. Yeah, party. As long as not the banana one, it's fine. Uh, what if you order this? Ban Kung. Okay, what is it? <laughs> it's like a rice noodle thing. It's specialized. Sorry. And I order a bunch of random other stuff. It is what vegetables with kind of meat. Yeah. Uh, I'm not gonna dip to it with this at all, but tastes like egg. Yeah. It's nice. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Actually gone from one extreme to the other today. We were eating at this local Vietnamese place just tucked away around the corner from the busy crowds, and now we've come to the Shamrock Irish pub. Cheers! Well, it's nice to have a proper cool full pint. Amazing music playing. This guy's got an awesome guitar and just sit here and watch the sunset with all these lights, all the lanterns lighting up. It's night time, lanterns are on, and it's just so beautiful here. I think it's just only the first day, but already my favorite place in Vietnam. Pretty, man. Real pretty. Yeah, man. These lanterns were introduced by the Chinese immigrants at the end of the 16th century, when Hoi An was a bustling commercial port exchanging goods with merchant ships from Asia and Europe. Other than their practical uses, the lanterns were a way for the Chinese to pay homage to their motherland. They're made from bamboo and silk, and as silk had become one of Hoi An's top commodities, the lanterns grew in popularity. And so, the rest of the community began to hang lanterns as well, for decoration, and also in the hope of bringing good luck and a sense of coziness to the town. There's a really nice vibe to the town actually, like it's it's busy but it still feels calm and it still feels chilled out. So you could easily spend all evening just wandering around the streets just soaking it all in. So we come to the night market by the river. 
get some food, we've got tons of different food on offer. Street food in Asia is just the best. I mean, it's probably not the cheapest one we'll get because we're in a very touristy spot. Just this freshly cooked meat when you're feeling a bit crackish. Hits the spot, absolutely hits the spot. Sitting down on the small seats. <laughs> <laughs> Very spicy. I put too much on my bun me. Hello. You get me? Call the banana pancake with Nutella. Voila. Yes, yeah, this is my private room in a hostel. It's only like, what, 13 pounds? I don't know, 16, 17 dollars a night for a private room. And they got so much on at this hostel. Like, it's really well organized. Like, they'll have lots of free different day activities. Uh, and they'll also help you book all the activities you want to pay for, on with transport. They got parties every night. Tell everyone your name. My name? Eric. Eric. Anything you want. Eric's your man. You got it? <laughs> so this morning I'm going to do this basket boat experience. Uh, Miles, who I met in that Trang, he recommended it, so it should be a good laugh. Um, only takes like an hour and a half, including the journey there and back and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Had some in character now. So I think we're going to have a little ride around. Maybe do a bit of fishing, a bit of paddling ourselves. So I think we're about to have a go at fishing. Some crab fishing? Yeah. So we're getting a little rod each. <laughs> Let's see what we can get. Yeah, crabby, crabby. Better put the bait right by it, and they all just ran back inside. Crab fishing failed so far. Go. Oh, here we go. Oh, yeah, 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 oh. yeah. Oh, no, I want time. No, we yeah. Hmm. Oh. Again. Oh. Three. Oh. 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 <laughs> Got three crabs now. Wow. Wow. Oh. <laughs> yes. So we've done our fishing, we've spun around a bit, but it now it sounds like we're going to a rave. It's only like 11 a.m., but getting the party started here. I didn't want to do the spinning thing on the boat because any kind of ride that just spins around like that just makes me want to throw up, you know. I love a good roller coaster, but spinning stuff, no. How do you feel? It was nice. Yeah? It gets dizzy after. Yeah. Huh? How do you feel? Yeah, good. <laughs> Not feeling sick? <laughs> no, 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 no. Where are you from? Taiwan! Taiwan! Where are you from? UK! Oh, UK! Yeah! Welcome to Taiwan! <laughs> that was good, clean, fun. Nice and relaxing ride around. Thank you very much. Okay! <laughs> After a fun morning with the basket boat experience, I head back into town and hide out a bicycle from the hostel to go explore one of the nearby villages. Alright, so I got myself a bicycle for the afternoon. A Lee T basket at the front. It feels very weird after having, you know, been on a motorbike and a scooter a lot this trip. Being on a bike, like a normal bicycle, it's like, what do you mean I have to pedal? So, yeah, nothing I need to do, but I'm gonna go explore Cam Kim Island. 
uh, just across the bridge from the main bit of town. Yeah, you normally do it on a tour with the hostel or whatever, but I'm just gonna explore it myself and see what I find. So maybe it would have been good to have a guide just explain what I'm seeing because it's like, ah, yep, it's a village, it's where people live, it's beautiful. Not much else to say about it though. But it's nice just getting away from this sort of busy part of town and have a little ride around. It's funny though because like I love Hawaii to death but there's obviously plenty of tourists there. But like anywhere in the world you just go a tiny bit further and it's just normal people going about their lives, you know? Yeah, it's worth doing. If you're in Hawaii, just come to Camp Kim, have a cycle around, see what's sort of more day-to-day -day kind of rural life, and you find little beautiful little spots like this. Back in town, Danny and I had signed up for an evening street food tour with the hostel. And the first stop on a street food tour is a restaurant. So. <laughs> You get this stuff to put on the rice paper, you have to massage it. Does anyone want one? No happy ending, just massage. Massaging it, massaging it. Fork stick. See? Perfect. It's just like the worst roll ever. Most Indian people would be ashamed of my rolling skills, but. Right. As you can see, looks perfect. Mm. Oh, you go. Yeah. It's really good, see? Despite my shit rolling. Alright, second effort. A lot better. A lot better. Everyone on the table is very impressed. <laughs> We're doing a street food tour organized by the hostel. Okay, Emma. And basically, it's a really good way, if you've come backpacking in Vietnam and you want to try the local food but don't really know how to go about doing it, signing up for a tour like this is a really good idea. I've been fortunate on this trip to sort of try a lot of local food with the help of Danny, but other people, you might not know what to order, what means what. So this kind of thing is really helpful. But anyway, today we're going to head to Da Nang, go up the Barna Hills to the Golden Bridge, which is sort of a place that's kind of exploded on Instagram the last couple of years. So, be interesting to see what it's actually like, see if it's worth the day out, worth the cost of the ticket going up there, or whether it's just a picture. So, let's go find out. Hiring out a scooter from the hostel, it was just over an hour's ride to the Barna Hills. This place feels like a theme park, and it's because it is a theme park, but it feels like we're it doesn't feel like we're in Vietnam, it's all modern and brand new and it's kind of strange. Starbucks. What is this doing here? <laughs> True taste of Vietnam. <laughs> Starbucks. We're literally just riding through fields with real water buffaloes and then we've paid money to come to a place where they have fake ones. <laughs> this is so weird. Ciao. Come in, please. After you. So it's 750000 for a ticket, which is like 30 US dollars, which in normal life's nothing. In Vietnamese life, that feels, feels like a fuckload of money. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. And we just beat a massive tour group, so we got it to ourselves. Here we go. Well, that's your one to let. Yeah. The cable car ride is 5.8 kilometers long and holds the record for the longest non-stop single track cable car in the world. Towering high above the lush green forest below, it climbs up to a height of nearly 1500 meters above sea level. Ever since I was like a two year old kid going on family holidays in Switzerland, I've just absolutely loved cable cars. So going on this was something pretty special. Yeah. Like done. <laughs> done. It's like we're walking inside Instagram. Well, I just got here. It's pretty impressive, actually. I mean, I make all the cynical Instagram jokes, but it's really cool when you're here. 
The concept of the bridge was to have two giant godlike hands bursting out from the hills. Made from fiberglass, these hands support a golden thread of a bridge to guide people through nature as they walk above the treetops. And the legend of its construction dates all the way back to 2017. So a little travel hack, you can queue for the platform or just stand on the flower bed right beside you. Alright, so now what do we do? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Let's go home. Just go back. The giant Buddha's over there. The giant Buddha? It's alright. Giant Buddha, let's go. I still haven't quite figured this place out. It's like walking around a theme park without any rides. It's with the pigs. <laughs> the monkey king. It's very popular and Asian looking, like, that's like the Superman. Monkey King, we'll go. <laughs> I watched a show when I was a kid. Yeah. So the plan is we're getting a cable car to another part of the park where there might actually be a ride. Ooh, yeah, I know, it's pretty right. exciting. <laughs> there we go. So there's a lot of construction going on down here where maybe they'll build rides or more pigs? I don't know. That's like quite a spooky shot there. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, see the line? It's huge. Well, it's the only thing to do. So <laughs> there's a line. It's Europe. Yeah, Europe. <laughs> I think it's all of Europe is exactly like this as well. It's kind of like they wanted to do their own Harry Potter world, but couldn't get the rights, so they just made it slightly different. <laughs> so I think the thing to understand about the Barnard Hills is, Barnard Hills isn't aimed at Western tourists, it's for Asian tourists really because there'll be plenty of Asian tourists there who may have never been to Europe or may never even get to go to Europe, I don't know. And so for them it's like a cool fairy tale, fake version of Europe. But for us Western tourists, you know, I've come to Vietnam to see Vietnam, not to see a fake version of Europe. So you spend the whole time wandering around going, what the, what the hell is this place? What am I doing here? I mean, I admire it as a piece of construction, like the cable car is incredible, and the whole huge fairy tale village they've built on top of the mountain, but it's just not actually that much to do there. It's like mostly overpriced restaurants and cafes. So it didn't take too long before we got the cable car back down. So, you know, like I said, the cable car ride was epic. It was beautiful, and going over that rainforest, especially on the route down over the waterfalls, just looked incredible, so that was good. Wow. And the Golden Bridge is impressive, but there's so much better things you can do with your time and money whilst you're here. So, you know, personally, I'd skip it. It was our last day in Hoi An before we hit the road again, so we decided just to have a chill day on the beach. Yeah, I've really enjoyed Hoi An, really enjoyed it. I mean, it's such a beautiful town and there's so much to do. But we've also had just so many fun evenings here as well. Like at the hostel bar, there's a really great crowd and they've got something on every night. I mean, we even went to a neon party one night, which was a bit of a throwback to sort of backpack in Thailand when I was younger. Although I much preferred the dive bar in town because that had like a live band and a pool table and that was that was much more my scene. But yeah, we had some really good times, some heavy, heavy nights, <laughs> but some really good times. And now we're heading on to the town of Wei and to get there we're going to be biking along the Hai Van Pass which was made popular in the Top Gear Vietnam special and so now in Vietnam we just get referred to as the Top Gear Challenge, that's how they try and sell it to everyone. So you pay your money and hire out a bike and drive it one way and they'll take it back for you. And so that's what we're going to be doing today. Uh, one of the nice things is you can hire out a bike, you don't have to bring it back, and they transport your bag for you so you don't have all your shit on your bike, which is great. Except I left my GoPro in that bag, 
so it's going to be very hard to film this motorcycle challenge as we go. So basically what that means is we're going to film our own version of Top Gear but with lower production values and hopefully less casual racism. So first stop's going to be Marble Mountains, so let's hit the road. Hit the road. The Marble Mountains are a cluster of five marble and limestone hills that are about a half hour drive from Hoi An. Danny and I were joined by Chris from the UK. We met on the beach yesterday and we're going to explore what's called the Water Mountain as each mountain is named after the five elements. I'd say we follow the signs to this cave and we'll probably get yeah. things out along the way. The entrances are so cool. So pretty around here, and they've carved it all out of the mountain, which is really impressive. There you go, further up. Yeah. I'll probably just take my backpack off. <laughs> yeah, get skinny. <laughs> <sighs> <Oof>. <laughs> Well, I made it to the top, and it's one hell of a view. So Hoi An's back that way. I've got the down behind the shirt. Amazing view all around. It's a new world. Boom. <laughs> all right. <laughs> yeah. These rocks are so slippy. Whoa. Another huge cave right here. There are several Buddhist and Hindu grottos within the Marble Mountains. The sanctuaries feature statues as well as relief depictions of religious scenes carved out of the marble. So you think you're in the main bit of the cave, and then you go around a corner and it opens up. It's like, whoa! This is so impressive. Light rays coming through, being down on the temple. I'm climbing up to the highest peak now. Very, very steep stairs. Made it to the top of the highest peak. Oh, that was hard work. This has been awesome, but we're gonna make a move, get on with our Top Gear challenge. And those hills over there, that's actually where we're gonna be driving around. All right, so we're at the start of the High Van Pass. Uh, it's the road here. This is what we're gonna be driving above. You can see the train going down there as well, but just gorgeous beaches. And this road kind of weaves along beside the coast. Man, it is so, so beautiful. I mean, we're just literally just at the start of it, and if we're gonna get these views for the next hour, it's gonna be sick. All right, I just made another quick stop all along the road. You've got all these little cafes you can stop at with viewpoints, selling drinks, even beer, which obviously you don't wanna drink. <laughs> but yeah. The views are just incredible. It's such a nice drive, winding along here. See why it's a popular route. We just come over the hill, and so way well, kind of that way. But the views are just insane. Basically, stopping every like two minutes just to take it in, have a look, take some pictures. That's what we're riding towards down there, the way it's just sort of around the corner. I like it, Danny. Oh, I love it. Beautiful. Man, I mean, people said the high event was good, but yeah, it didn't have to be spectacular. All right, let's go. After we'd finished the pass, we still had about an hour and a half's worth of riding to reach Hue. 
All right, I've made it to Way. I've got a couple of nights here in Way. Uh, I think I'm just gonna keep it simple and just sign up for some like a little city tour and then another tour to the DMZ and just keep it simple, have someone else show me around rather than do it myself. Uh, feeling a bit lazy after that long drive. But yeah, yeah, awesome day of riding. A bit tired, but I'm just gonna settle in, enjoy Way for a couple of days. Just coming to town to get some much needed food and Emmanuel's back. Uh, Hello! Hey, I'm good back. To it's a too. pleasure to see you. Hey, we're gonna, are you ready? <laughs> <laughs> The city tour I'd sign up for was going to take us to the main sites of Huey, including the citadel, as well as some of the tombs of the old emperors. I was being lazy and just signing up for the city tour rather than doing it myself, and it's already turned into a bit of a clusterfuck. The day tour doesn't include the entrance fees for any of the sites we're visiting, which is fine, except a lot of other people in the group weren't told this when they booked the tour, which led to a lot of arguments kicking off from the word go. And this is one of those tours you arrive, you're like, ah. Oh. I've made a mistake, but we're going to make the most of it. Hopefully it's all uphill from here. The first stop was a 19th century citadel. Hue was the imperial capital of Vietnam during the Nguyen dynasty from 1802 to 1945. And within the citadel is the imperial city where the emperor lived and worked. Basically the city was built to protect the religious and political activities of the region. And so yeah, the emperor's house here, and obviously a lot of the place got damaged during the Vietnam War, or the American War as they call it here. Kind of reminds me of the Forbidden City in Beijing, there's just a lot less people. Next up, we went on a quick Dragon Boat River cruise, dropping us off at the Pagoda of the Celestial Lady. All right, so this Pagoda is the oldest Pagoda in the city, and it's built in 1601. And they've got these five monuments around it for the five elements, and one of them's got the second largest bell in Vietnam. After we had lunch, we drove out of town to visit the royal tombs of three different emperors. There were a total of 13 emperors during the Nguyen dynasty, and these monuments were often designed and built whilst they were alive in preparation for their death. Now we are with the number two emperor, Ming Ma. He has 500 wives. Oh, yes. He has 500 oh, yeah. wives and 142 children. Wow. Busy, busy, busy men. Busy men. Yeah. Very busy. <laughs> I'm wondering if he actually had names for all the kids, <laughs> or knew all their names. But yeah, the whole site is 15 hectares big, and no one actually knows where he's buried in the grounds. It was kept a secret. So even though he had 500 wives, only the first one becomes queen. The rest are just notches on the belt, if you like. <laughs> All right, two number two this afternoon. I think this is for the 12th emperor. The 12th emperor out of the 13. So this is the emperor's tomb here, but apparently the ceiling guy painted it, painted it with his feet. He had scaffolding set up and painted it with his feet. I don't know why. So I asked him how come they painted the ceiling with his feet. And he's like, because it's very difficult, so he just wanted to put that extra bit of effort in and just show off, basically. So this last tomb we come to is from the fourth emperor, and because we come right at the end of the day, it's actually really peaceful here, there's not many people about, and the sun's setting, so the light's really good, so yeah, it's pretty, pretty beautiful. Basically for this last tomb, I've kind of just walked away from the group. Just wandered around by myself because it's so quiet here right now. It's nice to have a bit of a long time. I think they spent three years building this tomb and it's 15 hectares, so uh, same as the first one we went to. But yeah, this guy only had, I think it's like 103 wives, but no children, so they adopted. And one of these places is the resting place for his wife, his first wife who becomes the queen. But these places are just magnificent. <laughs> I wasn't sure what to expect when he said we're going to go see some tombs today. I thought there might just be a tomb in a building, but these huge grounds that they've built are just beautiful, just magnificent. Uh, yeah, 
Really glad I made the effort to come here, even if the tour's been a bit iffy. It's still awesome to come out here and see all this stuff. Today, doing a tour of the old DMZ, the demilitarized zone, and then I'm going to be dropped off in a town near there and put in a bus to go up to Phong Nha. The one thing we're missing right now is our bus for the day. The bus showed up and it broke down, so I'm just waiting around until they get that sorted. Thank you, go. It was about a three hour drive to our first main stop, the Khaesan Combat Base which was a major U.S. Marines outpost during the Vietnam War. So I'm in Khe Sanh, which was, it was like a sort of like a cork in a bottle to sort of stop the flow of the Viet Cong coming in the Ho Chi Minh Trail from Laos into South Vietnam. This helicopter is absolutely huge. Bloody hell. I got a shot down plane here. This place just got battered to death by bombs and artillery from both sides. And the US Marines described being here as just hell on earth. So it's kind of strange being here at a place where so much death and destruction happened. So I'll just be walking around as a tourist taking pictures. But it's fascinating to see nonetheless. Leaving Khe Sanh, we drove back down the way we came towards the coast. We then turned north towards the Benhai River, which ran through the demilitarized zone. But we didn't actually stop at this memorial site for the DMZ on this DMZ tour because of pff, reasons. But we made our way to this afternoon's main attraction of the Vinh Mok Tunnels. Now, the Ku Chi Tunnels I visited in the south were part of a massive network that would often be underneath the villages. But here at Vin Mok, they moved the entire village underground. This was to avoid the intense bombing from the US. And for six years, the villagers lived underground in a tunnel system that had three different levels going down to 24 meters deep. Today, we are going to visit the second and the third floor of this tunnel system. This goes so, so deep. <laughs> Incredible. Yeah, mate. So when they dug out these tunnels, obviously they had to get rid of all the, the mud and the clay. So what they do is wait for night time and then just put it in the sea so get washed away. So they wouldn't leave any clues or traces above ground for the Americans to see when they flew over. Like we're using this room for meeting, for big operation, for wedding, even for the children like kindergarten before the baby was born inside. This is the one that wasn't discovered, didn't get flooded, didn't collapse, and we got no one die inside. 575 person at peak times were leaving for six years, but no one died. So that was made it special. But you know, the people who was fighting at that time, they just want to live in peace at all. They didn't care about communism and capitalism. After the tour, I was dropped off at the town of Dongha so that I could get the bus up to Fongya, where I'll be spending the next three nights. So I just finished up the DMZ tour. Um, seeing it going to Khe Sanh was cool, that was interesting, and the tunnels was interesting, but the whole day was about 85, 90% driving. And if you did it self-driving, it might have been all right, but we had a whole tour group crammed up like sardines in one of those minivans for hours on end. And then we only had a short time at each place to see a couple of things, so. Whether it's worth it for the day, I'm not so sure. But now we're in Dong Ha, one of these bus rest stop places, waiting for the bus to pick us up to get to Fong Nha. So I think the bus should be here in about an hour, and it should be two hours to Fong Nha, but literally have no idea. So it could be here half an hour, could be here all night, I have no idea what's going to happen. But that's the way it goes sometimes. 
See, the nice thing about Southeast Asia is they sell beer everywhere. Temples, tombs, you name it. So if you've got some time to kill, just grab one. Cheers, mate. <laughs> The bus is here. It's only 20 minutes later than it's supposed to be, so it's actually not too bad. All settled in, ready to go. I think it's only two hours. But the bus is so comfy, so let's get it on now. Well, welcome to Fonya. My first day here, I'm just giving myself a chill day. I'm not actually doing anything. I'm just sitting by the pool, relaxing and uh, recharging my battery, sort of literally for my cameras and figuratively for myself. I mean, there's so many things that I want to do in Fong now, but I'm kind of having to resist that temptation because the trip's been pretty full on. And if I don't give myself a couple of days just to relax and take it easy, uh, I run the risk of burning myself out. But I had my last beer with Danny because he's going to move on and finish off his bike trip. And we had such a good laugh together over the last two to three weeks. And I was actually just really lucky to be able to travel with him. But you know, everyone's doing similar routes here, but on different schedules. Like Emmanuel's one stop ahead of me. So I'll meet up with him in Hanoi. But I'm sure I'll make plenty of new friends in the meantime before then. But then tomorrow I've signed up for a trip to go to Paradise Cave and Dark Cave. Because that's what this region's famous for is exploring caves, so I can't wait to do that tomorrow. That should be awesome. Fongya is actually home to the largest cave in the world, the Songdong Cave. But less than 1,000 people are allowed to trek into it per year, and it costs you $3,000 to do so. So I'll happily settle for the two I'm seeing today. First up, we made a quick stop at the Fonya Botanic Garden to check out the waterfalls. Beautiful. Then we headed to Paradise Cave, which was discovered in 2005 by the same local man who found the Songdong Cave. Okay, we're now climbing up to Paradise Cave. 500 steps up, I think. When you go in, it's just walk down and then it's this huge well, cavern just opens up in front of you. And it just takes your breath away. So, not to state the obvious, but this place is huge. I've never been in a cave like this. I've been in plenty of caves, but this is another level and they've lit it all up so you can just really appreciate the scale of it so this cave paradise cave goes on for 31 kilometers we can only go in for one kilometer and then after that i don't think it's lit up anymore you have to do like a special adventure tour to go further in but only like another few k so it's just a thing that just keeps going and going and going. I mean, it's like it's like something from a different world, like a different planet. It's unreal. The caves of Fongya National Park are roughly 350 million years old. The rock formations coming down from the ceiling are called stalactites, whilst the corresponding formations rising from the ground are stalagmites. Basically, because it's limestone, as the water drips through, it has sand in it. And basically, you know when you're a kid on the beach and you form this, you got like wet sand, and you just form this weird shapes out of it. It's basically like that, but over the course of millions of years. And you end up with these giant, giant sculptures. Alright, 
reached the end of the line here, one kilometer in. I'm gonna go on a special tour to go further down there. Oh, wow. It's one of those ones, I hope the video can do it justice. <laughs> it's just incredible in here. Just insane. And once you're a bit further away from the crowd, all you can hear is just dripping water and that's it. It's so quiet. It's very hard to find words to describe things like that other than wow. It's amazing. Uh, you just gotta kind of see it for yourself and just experience the, the scale of it. So yeah, that was really fun, really, really fun. I love that. Next up, we were heading to the dark cave. This one's going to be a bit more active as we'll be zip lining, swimming, kayaking, and crawling into basically a mud bath. But before we got started, we were treated to an absolute feast of a lunch. And then you roll it, you dip in with tomato soup, yeah? Oh, and no. dip on the chicken pork. You eat together with lemon shot. It's more delicious, yeah? I think this is going to be really good fun. This is going to be really, really good fun. Done. All right, we gotta swim to the cave now. Get on with it. Oh. So basically, we're approaching a dark cave, and I don't want to be crude, but it looks like a giant vagina. I'm only going because I have one. Take it from the expert. <laughs> Okay. So head to the mud bath. You right? That's where we have I can confirm the helmets work. <laughs> The only one that's turning our head like, what's that? You'll never see it. Hello. <laughs> Alright. We have arrived at the mud hall. Welcome to the mud spa. That's one way to get in. <laughs> Walking along and fell in a pothole. Someone's brought up me. Yeah, good shot. That's what I can't do. I'm going to pull myself off. This probably goes very deep there. Yeah, I don't know. Made it out of the cave. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> but now we're going to kayak back across. Bye bye. <laughs> wow, we finished up now at the dark cave. Uh, that was so much fun. Uh, the mud bath was great. That was a really cool experience. And then there was like a, there's like rope swings and zip lines you can do, which obviously I didn't do. I just went for a swim in the water and then a the guy started shouting at me for not wearing a life jacket. I was like, dude, I can swim, but Today has been a really, really fun day. One of the best days of the trip so far. I wish I could have spent more time in Fonya because there's loads more here that I'd want to do. But I've got to keep moving because everything's about to shut down for a few days for the Tet Luna New Year's celebrations. Happy New Year! Sign up for this little guided bike tour. That's your, that's your... This is my... I wasn't driving, I was just like... Clearly. Okay. <laughs> it shows how easily you can arrive at a place not knowing anyone, then within a couple of hours you've got a whole group of friends to spend the day with. Yeah, it's like $10. $10 to buy 36 beers. Yay! I'm 
getting a bus today up to Hajiang to do the Hajiang Loop, and this is the thing that everyone raves about. And it'll be a different end to the trip than what I planned, but it's the right end to the trip for what I want and how I'm feeling right now.